Ah, good morning, everyone. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name's Nathan Newman. I'm the Executive Intelligence and Risk Assessment at NAB. Uh, obviously, thank you to ACAMS for inviting me back again this year, and I'll be moderate, moderating this session on uh, Financial Crime 2022, Emerging Trends and Typologies. I just want to throw out and say welcome to those that couldn't participate here uh, physically and those participating virtually online. Um, I, there will be some poll questions as well, so please make sure you've downloaded the app ready for those poll questions. I think you can answer them now if you really want to get ahead of the game. Look, for the program, there'll be some slight detours from the program, so anyone that was coming here to talk about Section 501, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint you, we won't be talking about that, but we do have some exciting presentations from our participants and some great insights, particularly off the back of what's been talked about this morning around some of the risks that we're, we're seeing and some of those emerging issues as well. Uh, I do want to note very quickly that some of the presentations, uh, it ha does have some sensitive information, so I just ask you to be conscious of that, uh, recognising the, the, the nature of it. Um, we will have some Q&A at the end, so we will have an opportunity to answer the questions, um, but otherwise we'll run through a few presentations in the first instance. Uh, for that, I will invite Stephen Demetto to come and speak. Uh, Stephen is a commander with the Australian Federal Police and currently the Acting Commis Assistant Commissioner of Eastern Command. He served more than 20 years in the AFP, uh, formed with Austrac the Joint Threat Financing Group. His extensive experience in counter-terrorism money laundering investigations in Australia and has done secondments to the UK's Metropolitan Service in their CT command as a member of the senior management team and in the UK's National Crime Squad's money laundering investigations team. He was Senior Investigating Officer for the AFP in the Malaysian Airlines disaster, MH17, in the Ukraine. Uh, Stephen is a chartered accountant as well, and a qualified lawyer, so he may be subject to some of the regulations we're seeing. Uh, but I invite you, Stephen, to come up and, and give us a presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan, and um, thank you, everyone, to have me here, and thank you, ACAMS, to have me here as well. Um, so what I thought I'll do is, if I get this to work, is really, I suppose, provide some context in relation to counterterrorism, and um, hopefully, if I provide some context and what this current threat environment is, it will really uh, help you in, in your day-to-day -day jobs. Um, I also will speak a little bit about, um, I suppose, the AFP and, and Australia's approach to counterterrorism investigations, and I'll touch on. Um, as Nathan highlighted, the Joint Threat Financing Group, which is our vehicle um, in regard to financial intelligence, and then just touch on some threat and risk uh, indicators. So hopefully you, um, you find that some assistance. As you can see the screen up there, um, when we talk about counterterrorism in Australia, the ter a Terrorist Act is defined in the, in the Criminal Code, and it talks about ideology. And it's mainly around religious, ideological, or political ideology. So what the main two forms that we see, um, and this is the terminology we sort of use now, is you've got the religious motivated violent extremism, which is the old Islamist threat um, that we've been dealing with. And then we've got the ideologically motivated violent extremism. And that's probably uh, the old term you may be more familiar with is the extreme right wing or those sort of, um, uh, those sort of groups. So they're, they're, I suppose, the two main ideologies that we uh, look at in regard to counterterrorism. So for one thing, to prove a terrorist uh, offence, um, um, you need to show that some sort of ideology, and you also need to show that there, there's some, I suppose, intention by the individual to coerce or influence the public or the government as a whole. Um, but as I said, that's defined in 100.1 in the Criminal Code. One thing I just want to say, I suppose, when we talk about the, what we say is IMVE or the extreme right wing, um, we break that down, I suppose, into nationalist and racist, which is probably the more common one that you'd be aware of, um, but also covers things like anti-government, um, sovereign citizens, um, individuals that want to form new governments here in Australia, and we've had a couple of um, um, arrests over the last couple of years in relation to that. We also include groups like the anarchists um, and revolutionary sort of groups, and I suppose a grey area that we look at is that more that issue specific sort of uh, ideology, things like anti-lockdown, things like vaccine mandates. Now there's nothing wrong with having those beliefs, but if it, um, it pushes into violence or some sort of violent extremism, that's when um, police normally get involved. Mm -hmm. 
So just uh, in regard to the current CT environment, the current threat level for Australia is probable. So what that means is that it's assessed by our security agencies that there are individuals out there that have developed the intent and capability of doing a terrorist act. What we're seeing though is I suppose a little bit different. So this probable has been around in Australia since September 2014, that's been our threat level. And then if you remember back in 2014, I suppose the main focus back then was on um, Islamic State and what was happening in Syria. But we have seen a shift to, I suppose, more soft targets and more, um, I suppose, more improvised weapons and less, I suppose, what we would refer to as attack planning. So these are, rather than the big international uh, groups, we're seeing more, I suppose, the lone wolf sort of arrangement and people getting um, radicalised um, individually. Um, and then looking for those soft targets in the attack. What that means, though, is, and you would see from examples overseas, especially in the UK and what they've had in the last couple of years, is uh, it doesn't take a lot of capability to conduct a terrorist attack. It could be as much as grabbing a knife and then um, doing an attack that way. And we saw one in the New Zealand, for example, in the supermarket last year, where the individual was in a supermarket and grabbed a knife off the, uh, off the shelf and started attacking people. So um, that's one of the differences we've seen as well. Um, I suppose uh, what happened in Christchurch really brought that um, IMVE um, to the fore. Um, and there's been a lot of people that have really been influenced by that individual and as well um, and motivated. And we've seen that um, not only with our investigations here, but of course some of the attacks in the US more recently. So as I said, more simple, less intensive, smaller scale attacks um, is what we've seen. What's also been, I suppose, a little bit frightening is uh, an increased involvement in the uh, youth here in Australia. So you can probably put that down to a number of reasons, but one reason that we're, I suppose, hanging on is in regard to COVID and that, that push of, of individuals online um, and getting radicalised online and so we've certainly seen a lot, lot more younger people involved and with that internet use things like recruitment, radicalisation, training, financing and even coordination of attacks, um, we've seen all that happen online and COVID certainly, is, well we believe, has been one of the um, bigger factors in relation to that. And the, and the trouble, I suppose, with our youth is uh, we, we see, a, I suppose, a, a disproportionate um, amount of um, vulnerable youth, youth that come from broken homes, uh, youth that may carry some sort of mental illness um, and issues like that. So the IMV threat is uh, evolving. Um, so like I said, we're still seeing both threats out there, both the religiously motivated and the ideologically motivated. Um, but I'll focus on the IMVE just because it is, I suppose, something a little bit newer, um, um, really that's really popped its head up over the last few years. Of course, there's January 6 in the US as well, which has really brought it to the fore um, as well. But most of it has been that na nationalist and racist propaganda. There's been a lot of media around certain groups here in Australia um, that carry their white-only policy. Um, and again, it's not just about that ideology, but it's about having that violent tendency that, that, um, uh, that we look at. And of course, there's a grey area between terrorism and hate crime, um, which is another big issue that we face. Um, What also we're finding with these IMVE groups is that normally they're probably a little bit more security conscious as well, which of course makes our job a little bit harder. Um, but um, it's something that I suppose that we, we keep looking at. The, the threat is evolving. It's like I said, from attack planning, larger groups wanting to do um, violent acts here in Australia to smaller groups or individuals um, getting radicalised online. So what we normally saw, I suppose, you know, during you know, 2014, I said our threat assessment changed to probable. So during the Sy Syrian conflict, we mainly seen, and it was mainly male, mainly ma uh, men in their 20s and 30s, um, often first or second generation immigrants. 
and mainly residing in our large cities was, I suppose, a very a general way of looking at the demogra demographic of potential terrorists here in Australia. But with the increase in the IVE and the, in the racist and nationalist uh, sort of ideology, there has been really a change in the profile of the offenders. Again, while still mar largely male, uh, these now are a lot more diverse in regards to education, um, locations a lot different, it's not just the big cities anymore, a lot of our regional towns as well, um, and also um, affiliations are very mixed, it changes depending on, I suppose, what, what cause they're fighting at the time. So a group like Islamic States or, or a Qaeda stay very much, uh, you know, you, once you join, you very much stay in there. Um, we're seeing people come and go in the IMVE space out of different groups and changing, and these groups are evolving all the time. So just a quick um, update of the CT environment. I suppose um, the Australia's approach to counterterrorism investigations, every capital city has a joint counterterrorism team. So that's made up of the Australian Federal Police, our state and territory partners, as well as ASIO. Um, but we, of course, work with all government departments in really trying to meet this threat. Um, Australia has a counterterrorism strategy. It, it covers uh, four separate parts. One's prevent, prepare, respond and recover. Um, and police sort of have an involvement in each of those different types. I've jumped ahead, but just uh, uh, one thing I do want to touch on is the legislation. So most of the counterterrorism offences sit in the Australian Criminal Code. Um, that includes not only conducting a terrorist attack, but also acts in preparation. So if you've got the intent, you've got the ideology, you want to coerce the government or the public, and you do an act in preparation to a terrorist attack, not, not one that needs to be specifically identified, you actually have committed an offence in Australia. And that's an offence that um, we've charged people a fair bit with. Um, but also there's a lot of terrorism financing offences in the criminal code as well, not only financing a terrorist or a terrorist act, but also financing a terrorist organisation. Um, there's a number of terrorist organisations that have been prescribed by the Australian government. Um, and we've had two recently uh, in the IMVE space as well in the last two years. Just one thing with the, uh, I suppose, with the threat and what's also been changing is what we call high-risk terrorism offenders. So it's not just the people that want to conduct attacks that are currently out in the public, it's potential uh, people that have been convicted of terrorist acts that are currently in jail and that are coming out of jail as well. Um, that uh, supermarket attack that I spoke about in New Zealand, that was somebody that had come out of prison. Um, and also there's a number of attacks in the UK um, one on London Bridge, you may recall, in 2017, that was somebody coming out of prison as well. So that's uh, something that we're very much uh, involved in, very much uh, aware of. A couple of new legislation that the Commonwealth Government has. We have now continuing detention orders where somebody comes to the end of their term and we can show that the risk is too great. A judge can order a continuing detention order, um, keeping that person in prison and also um, extended supervision order, which when they come out, then they're under um, specific supervision orders as well. Um, so there's Commonwealth um, legislation in relation to that. All right, I've, got, I've been told to hurry up, so I will. Um, threat financing, so, so the AFP, we are, with our partners, Austrac, we've, we've created the Joint Threat Financing Group so the Joint Threat Financing Group, his job is really to uh, work with financial intelligence, work with our private uh, partners, and, and they really assist all counterterrorism investigations in Australia. They're a national body uh, based in all our capital cities. Um, and like I said, their job is to support counterterrorism jobs as a whole, um, as well as terrorism financing. Um, one, the real key part of them, though, is, is to work with people like yourself. Um, we really, uh, we work very closely with Austrac and Finto Alliance, um, and we really, it's about that private-public partnership if we can. Um, just quickly, some threat and risk indicators in financial activity. Um, you know, the understanding the ideology, we believe is very important, as I hopefully I've shown. Um, it is a little bit different depending on what you're looking at. Um, you know, things like um, looking at certain codes and descriptions, um, and donations maybe to groups that have got um, extremist ideology or messaging as well. 
Um, of course, purchasing weapons or something like that. Um, crowd, we've seen crowdsource funding as well uh, to pay legal bills in one occasion. Um, and we're starting to see a lot more use of cryptocurrency as well um, in a part of some of the groups in regards to not only um, funding what they want to do here, but sending money overseas to groups overseas as well. So I suppose the key takeaways are uh, we believe it's important to understand the ideology that you're dealing with. Groups are very fluid. Um, it's not like it used to be uh, where people stay. Um, low sophistication for attacks. We're not seeing um, massive lead times to when an attack is to happen. Cryptocurrency is increasing. And really what we see is our next frontier and our next importance is really that private and public partnership we think is key uh, to meeting this threat. Sorry I rushed it at the end, but uh, thank you and looking forward to your questions later. Thank you, uh, Stephen. I, I think we could almost have one session dedicated to, to that topic, given the currency um, both here but also overseas as well. Perhaps an idea for ACAMS next year. Um, now, we did have a poll question. I'm hoping we can bring that up. Uh, on the screen. Yes, how much is your organisation focusing on issue motivated extremism? Uh, and there's three options, critical priority, some focus but not dedicated, or other crime types are a greater risk for us. Uh, if we can get the results of that. Hopefully if you're ticking away now. Some focus but not dedicated. Well, it's good to see some is a critical priority. Just perhaps, you know, depending on the, the environment, may ebb and flow a little bit. Um, but other crime types are greater risk for us. So uh, it seems to be at least more than half have some focus uh, on this type of risk. Thank you. With that, I'll move on. I'll in introduce our next uh, speaker, Vardana uh, Narayan, who is the Group General Manager Compliance at BSP Financial Group. Um, Prior to joining BSP uh, PNG in 2018, Vardana was attached to BSP Life Fiji as a general manager of legal and compliance. Vardana has over 27 years of professional experience in a broad range of legal and compliance work in Fiji, PNG, New Zealand and New South Wales, including 12 years in the insurance and banking industry. Vardana studied human rights law at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, and I understand worked for the Fiji Women's Crisis Centre uh, coordinating research into violence against women at one point as well. Um, she has a certificate in risk management from the Governance Institute Australia and a Bachelor of Laws from Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand, and is uh, visiting us from overseas. So Vardana, welcome. Please come up. Thank you, Nathan. Um, technology is not my friend, so I'm going to apologize in advance if I um, get the wrong slides up at the wrong time. Before I start, I just want to, um, just a disclaimer, I'm not, um, I don't have any academic qualifications in AML and I'm not pretending to be any sort of an expert, except for the experience that I have had um, in the you know, past, particularly the past 12 years, in setting up AML programs for um, financial institutions within the Pacific, and most particularly and most significantly for the BSP Financial Group in uh, Papua New Guinea, and for the um, wider Pacific Islands in which BSP operates. So if I can just, if I can get this to work, okay. So just introducing BSP, uh, because I'm going to talk to you from the perspective, really, of the experience that we have um, had at BSP. So just introducing BSP to you, uh, BSP is the largest bank in the South Pacific. It's the largest bank in Papua New Guinea. It is, um, we have 118 branches and sub-branches within Papua New Guinea and the Pacific, and we operate in the remotest areas of BNG where no other bank goes, and also um, in the capitals and the financial hubs um, in the countries in which we operate. We are also in Fiji, Vanuatu, the Solomon Islands, Tonga, Samoa, um, and the Cook Islands, as well as in Cambodia and Laos. So that's BSP for you. Um, just also from the perspective of um, 
where I'm coming from, we've had a lot of challenges in the past um, four years or so in trying to set up an AML team. And um, as I go further through my presentation, I think the challenges that we have had at BSP actually are reflected in the challenges that a lot of financial institutions have, and DNFPBs um, to a lesser extent, have within the Pacific in terms of getting the resources um, to, to actually implement effective AML programs. Um, we have grown from a team of six when I started in 2018 to a team of over um, 100 now. And um, I, I can't overemphasize how difficult it has been for us in terms of just getting the resources um, to, to um, get our programs underway. So um, in looking at the, my topic is identifying money laundering risk factors in the Pacific Islands and Papua New Guinea. And in looking at risk factors, I, I'm just gonna approach this in two ways. Firstly, going to look at the most common predicate offenses um, for money laundering. And our experience at BSP of high risk activities and behaviors is consistent with the national risk assessments um, that have been issued by the various FIUs um, in the Pacific and by the Financial Analysis and Supervision Unit in Papua New Guinea. And at this point, can I just acknowledge the presence here of the director of FASU, Mr. Wilson Onia and Mrs. Rosa Benick. Um, it's, it's really good to see some familiar faces in the room. But our um, experience of the red flags that we see, the high risk activities that we see um, within the um, banking sector, within BSP, is, as I said, consistent with what the um, national risk assessments have um, found. In particular, um, for PNG, the highest risk factor um, that was identified, or one of the highest risk factor that was identified in the national risk assessment was corruption and the misuse or abuse of government funds. And our experience certainly has been, if I was asked to rank um, the predicate offenses that, um, that are, uh, from which funds are actually um, laundered in PNG, I would say um, number one, corruption, number two, corruption, and number three, corruption because corruption is endemic, and um, unfortunately, corruption is endemic. It's at all levels. It's um, something that we, I would say over 80% of the suspicious matter reports that we file with FASU relate to corruption and the misuse of government funds. And um, the similar, uh, activities are also seen in our other branches in the Pacific, but not um, at the same levels as that which we see in Papua New Guinea. So um, one country where we do see um, higher or high levels, although not as large as PNG, is the Solomon Islands. Um, and we also see some corruption activities also in Vanuatu um, and Fiji as well. With, um, when I talk about corruption um, and the misuse of government funds, I mean, there's all different types of activities that, that make up obviously the definition of corruption. Um, there are a lot of facilitation payments that go on at all levels. Um, so whether it's payments being made to junior civil servants or whether it's payments that are actually being made to finance um, offices at um, district um, or provincial government level or national government level, there are very high levels of facilitation payments being made by private enterprise to um, those in the public sector um, and, and government. Um, there's also a lot of misuse of national and district government funds. Um, in particular, in recent years, we've seen a trend um, since, obviously, since 2019, 2020, of the misuse of COVID-19 funds. There's been a lot of uh, money that has been paid out to all the governments in the regions, the money that the government has then paid out um, to various district and regional um, governments. And what we have seen is that there is a high level of um, the misuse of these COVID-19 funds. There's also a high level of misuse of climate change funds, and this is also something that we see in the other islands, um, particularly in the smaller South Pacific countries where um, climate change is more of an issue. 
there is also a lot of, um, there are a lot of red flags that we see in terms of conflicts of interest in procurement, bribery in procurements and awards of contracts. Another, um, moving on from corruption and misuse of government funds, another um, theme that we see that recurs um, often is the breach of tax and foreign exchange control regulations. So this again is something that we see also in Fiji, the Solomon Islands, um, Tonga, Vanuatu. And this is where private um, entities, private enterprise um, don't declare business profits but remit funds offshore using their employees' bank accounts. So um, there are certain thresholds um, that individuals are allowed on an annual basis for remittance of funds offshore without having to take a tax clearance certificate. And foreign employers have often, we have seen many such schemes where foreign employers have used the employees' personal accounts to remit their profits offshore and try uh, structuring their um, the payments so that they keep below the tax thresholds, but at the um, same time, you know, using a large number of employee accounts so that they can remit um, substantial funds offshore without the tax office being aware. And, and as I said, this is the same sort of activity that we've also seen uh, in the other Pacific Islands as well. We've seen some illicit um, transnational flows of funds in Vanuatu illicit cross-border movement of funds, although that um, did decrease in terms of cash, movement of cash during the COVID period. Another area that is, um, has been referred to in the national risk assessments and certainly in Papua New Guinea and the Solomon Islands is illegal logging and illegal fishing. I'm not going to labor on that because the last session actually um, did talk about illegal logging and fishing. But except to say that it is very difficult for us as a financial institution to actually be able to detect illegal logging, um, particularly where the entities, the logging entities that we bank actually have the appropriate licenses and permits. Um, so as a, as a bank with um, limited powers in terms of what we can do, apart from exiting customer relationships, um, we can investigate up to the, um, you know, to see whether there are permits and licenses in place, but it's how the permits and licenses are actually obtained that again leads back to the whole issue of corruption. Um, so those are the main predicate offenses that we have noted um, in terms of our experience at BSB, uh, particularly as I said in Papua New Guinea. But apart from these common predicate offenses, there are also key risks and vulnerabilities that arise from the AML systems that are in place or rather that are not in place within Papua New Guinea and the Pacific. And um, I strongly believe that um, the Pacific needs AML solutions which are appropriate and aligned to the resources and the infrastructure of the Pacific. We have tended to react rather than to be proactive and we have tended to bring in laws and systems um, from highly developed countries, and I, I don't wish to offend anyone, but I do feel very strongly and passionately about this, that um, the Pacific is, you know, we're small. Uh, we've got very small countries. The Cook Islands has got, what, 10,000 people, and we've got a couple of branches there. Um, but when we bring in laws from developed countries, when we bring in, um, ideologies that are not supported by the infrastructure on the ground, then I think we are really setting ourselves up for failure. And I think that we need to actually plan and design so that we don't set ourselves up for failure. I'm not saying that we need to have a substandard system of AML um, in the Pacific and therefore you know, make ourselves um, attractive to money launderers. But what I'm saying is that we need to make sure that we have the support, we have the infrastructure actually in place before we actually start bringing in legislation. And it's actually been quite, um, probably not the right thing to say, but it was quite heartening for me to be here today and listen to others and, and know that um, these are not just problems that we have in the Pacific, but that um, these are also problems that you also encounter here in Australia as well. 
Um, but I think that we perhaps have it to a larger degree because um, the availability of resources and you know I was listening when we were talking the one of the previous speakers was talking about how it's going to get worse for resources but I can't imagine how it's going to get worse for resources because we have a lot of difficulty in actually getting any resources and as I said we've managed to grow our team with a great deal of difficulty and we've um, had to basically train people up from scratch because there hasn't really been any, um, any pool of talent that we have been able to choose from where people have had experience in these areas uh, before. So, okay, so I'll hurry up. Um, so we've got um, the, the key areas that I just very quickly will touch on is just, um, as I said, inappropriate or inadequate legislation that is designed for developed countries. Um, that does not provide adequate guidance. Um, we have been falling back on our own policies and this can lead to inconsistencies where banks apply um, the legislation differently and therefore customers are able to go and shop for the bank that actually has the lowest standards and which really um, goes against the, the imperative of the legislation. Um, I also really believe strongly that we don't need foreign aid to parachute in um, expertise, but what we need is for assistance to develop um, our own uh, resources in country. So what we noted during the COVID times when we couldn't, borders were closed and people couldn't come in is that everyone who could leave just left. Um, so what we really need is to develop the talent within um, PNG and the Pacific Islands and not just bring people in who are going to come in and give us invaluable um, expertise but then they leave um, and that's something that I really think we need to look at. Um, I've also spoken about the inadequate infrastructure and support. I think our FIUs, um, FASU, do a really good job but they need to be adequately resourced and they need to be supported. Um, we have a lot of law and order issues in our countries and um, the police forces and investigation agencies focus on those law and order issues. There's not enough training given to police forces and prosecution agencies and so the prosecution of money laundering offences is really way down the um, list of priorities. It's also shifts the burden of AML onto banks and other financial institutions which do not have um, the powers or have limited powers to enforce compliance. And this drives customers into the black economy and obviously um, creates other issues. So just as a final um, take on this, I just feel that the imposition of global standards on developing Pacific Island countries without first developing the infrastructure to support legislation can make our AML programs ineffective. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no doubt many challenges there. We do have a poll question as well, if we can go to that, uh, which I think is asking the question, if memory serves me, about the risks that others see in the Pacific region, yeah, what are the financial crime threat your organisation observes in the Pacific region? I suspect there's a couple of similarities there. And no doubt the challenges that you're talking about, Vanana, is the, is the situation around the de-risking that was discussed this morning as well, and obviously uh, issues there. Uh, hopefully people have had a chance to put in. If we could get the results up as well, that would be fantastic. Very diverse, very diverse. Money laundering leading the charge, fraud and scams, but corruption obviously one of those critical ones that are up there as well, uh, along with tax offences and fraud against government programs. Um, it would be interesting to compare that with Australia, I would imagine, and see what the difference would be, if any, if any. Fantastic, thank you. Okay, our last speaker, Tom McNally, uh, the head of AML Solutions uh, APAC at Contexa. Uh, Tom has been advising financial institutions on AML, CDF and sanctions technologies for over a decade. Uh, he's worked as an advisor to and within financial institutions in the areas of transaction monitoring, KYC and sanction screening uh, across the world. Uh, most recently in Contexa's head of AML KYC solutions in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, 
Uh, Tom regularly contributes thought leadership pieces to industry events and publications on topics discussing how financial institutions can utilise next-gen technology to manage their risks. And he's going to give us a bit of a spill on uh, some risk identification and perhaps how we need to think a little bit more advanced, I would say. Tom. Yeah, thanks Nathan, and hello everyone. I am incredibly conscious that I'm the person standing in between you and a refreshment break, so let's try and not overdo this um, and make it slight, somewhat snappy. Um, so I just kind of want to touch on a few themes that have been brought up you know, time and again throughout today. So we've been talking again around you know, resource, right? So increasing need for resources. We've been talking about the growth and evolution of different threat types. We're talking about a number of different indicators that have been kind of cropping up and continue to evolve. Um, and what this really presents is, you know, a bit of a challenge. Um, how do we manage, you know, mitigate, detect financial crime threats across all these different areas? So ideologically and, you know, religiously motivated extremism, state corruption, organized criminal gangs, you know, foreign state sponsored money laundering, many more. We've just spoken about logging, you know, corruption. Uh, so so the, the risk indicators involved are, are disparate and they're very different and traditionally we've looked to manage that through the use of you know, rules and scenarios. You know, when a new regulator or an industry body comes out with a red flag, it often turns up a one-to-one -one mapping into a new scenario, a new rule uh, that, that will get put into production and ultimately you know, more alerts that are being produced. Um, what this doesn't solve is the kind of perennial problem that we've got of false positives. So we've typically got, you know, over 95% false positives, our operational teams are at capacity, and, you know, quite rightly, we're introducing new indicators for new threats that are cropping up, things like crypto that didn't exist a few years ago. So how can we, you know, adequately manage new threats that are coming up at the same time, you know, as managing our risk and managing our operational burden? So one way that we look at it, or one way that I'd like to kind of get everyone to look at it is, can we actually look at these risks in aggregation? Can we make these risks more contextual? How can we leverage technology and actually understand the network in which our customers you know, engage, transact, who are their counterparties, and what is the context of how they're transacting? Um, and actually by aggregating and consolidating numerous risk, in risk indicators across the network, actually allows us to kind of reduce the false positives, but also uncover risk. Because our operators right now are often looking at risks in a very transient view, right? It's on a transactional basis. So if they are going to understand the bigger picture of the risks they're seeing, either they miss it or it takes a long time, sometimes months, to fully kind of unravel and unpick the, the risks that are truly associated to the red flags and indicators they're seeing. So, you know, we need the ability to detect multiple indicators in combination not in isolation. And what do I mean by this? So, you know, we see there being risks across various different categories that then form a network. The first type there is probably nothing new to everyone in this room. So I don't want to teach everyone to, you know, suck eggs, but uh, the presence of high-risk channels that our customers might be transacting within. So things like cross-border activity, things like cryptocurrency that's been mentioned already, and, you know, trade finance, all of these things we know present a higher risk of um, you know, nefarious activity taking place, of money laundering taking place, of corruption taking place. And what I'm not saying is we absolutely do not want to alert and stop every transaction within one of these high risk channels. But that you know, um, holistic view and kind of combining that KYC understanding of, our, of the channels our customer does transact in and then allows us to also kind of see where we are getting indicators of a higher risk. So when you kind of or add to the high-risk channels, and this is where it starts getting quite interesting, things like corporate hierarchy red flags. You know, so these are things that we really typically see as being prevalent within money laundering activities. It's the things like complex or opaque business structures, you know, um, frequently changed directorships on corporate entities, frequently changed addresses on corporate entities shell and shelf company indicators. So, you know, mismatches between the expected turnover of volume and what they're actually kind of logging and uh, transacting in. Um, so again, interesting, but do we really want to alert on any one of these things in isolation? Kind of got the, the next piece there, which is complicit counterparties. 
So you know, every, uh, every network relies on a broader network of illicit and complicit actors to allow, enable it to take place. So we've spoken a lot today around you know, tranche two, but these third party facilitators, things like professional services firms, lawyers, accountants, real estate, that are involved in the regular flipping and reflipping of companies, all of whom are absolutely essential to make sure that you know, money laundering is taking place. Things like semantic similarities. So, you know, I've got an example coming up shortly where we've got Phoenix and entities of a company that's previously been closed down. Another one might spring up, you know, out of the ashes like the mythical bird um, with a similar name. Uh, another indicator that it could also be somewhat suspicious. Uh, and then connected high-risk customers, you know, actually using the technology available to us to understand, okay, what customers have I exited? What customers are high risk? And who might share an address with them or a phone number, you know, or an email address? and actually building out that contextual view of who my customer is and understanding the network that they're within and therefore really gaining context of the risk that they pose. Next one there is comms. Uh, so Stephen spoke quite a lot and it's incredibly relevant in things like the, uh, the ideologically motivated extremism. So, you know, the use of encrypted networks, you know, membership indicators, uh, the use of key search terms within transactional or SWIFT messages or MPP payments or whatever it might be all of those, when added to the things before, become really interesting. And then finally, we get to the things that everyone's really looking for and alerting on today. So, you know, this is where you get to your, your high value, your high volume, your bursts in activity, U-turn transactions, cyclical transactions, um, you know, the, the transactions, the patterns of, you know, high-risk money laundering behavior. And when you actually start getting the presence of multiple indicators from across those different categories, that's when you can really start reducing your false positive rate and increasing your SMR conversion rate. Because we've really started to gain context of the transaction and the red flag or red flags and the kind of the network that they sit within. So there's a lot of words there. I'm now gonna try and bring it to life with a bit of a case study and show you, kind of wrap up and show what that actually really means. Um, now this is an anonymized case study. Um, but real, um, so just don't read too much into uh, the names of the banks or in fact the geographies involved. Uh, so what you're seeing on screen right now is or was a customer of the bank. So here we've got business A. Everyone can see that, yeah. Uh, and business A is based in Africa and it has two directors, director A and director B. And at first glance, you know, it looks like any other kind of import export business didn't seem to pose necessarily too much of a high risk. Uh, it was transacting you know, with entities in South America, uh, in the Middle East, and over in Asia. Um, for a while, actually, for, for a number of years. Uh, it then started to undertake some somewhat suspicious activity with some other entities in South, Southern Europe. Um, and this is when some red flags started to get raised internally within the bank. So the bank made a risk-based decision to actually off-board and exit this client for AML reasons. So there's our, there's our exited customer. What then happened uh, was somewhat miraculously, in another region, a very similarly named uh, entity was set up here in, in Australia uh, called Business B. Now, really interestingly, Business B had a semantic similarity to Business A, and the names are similar, but also it had shared um, directorship between Business A and Business B. So what we're seeing there is a classic example of a Phoenix operation. So, you know, risen again, as I mentioned before, risen from the ashes. Um, we also then saw Business C. So another entity here set up and incorporated in Asia, again, shared address with Business B and shared directors with Business A. And what we can see here is a typical approach that a professional money launderer is taking, right? Not to be deterred by controls and being exited from the bank. I'm going to move to another region, hopefully circumvent the bank's AML controls and set up and start my kind of laundering operation again. Gotcha. Um, and then even more interestingly, uh, we saw Business B and Business C start to retransact with actually Business A. So the previously off-boarded customer then became a counterparty of the client and the new clients to the bank, in addition to the previous counterparties that Business A was transacting with. So those ones in kind of Southern Europe, you can see there. So what we're kind of really seeing here is, you know, the funneling of funds out of Europe 
Uh, the actual case study was circumventing uh, currency controls within the African nation, uh, using, in, you know, inverted commas, trade finance to import goods when really they were just trying to get money out of the nation uh, as a bit of a funnel operation. And ultimately, these funds were then repatriated to Europe through your kind of standard SWIFT MT103 and uh, 202 messages. So you know what we're seeing there is that the cyclical transaction flow that I mentioned before. Now, bringing it back to kind of the nexus of this whole piece, um, you know, that would have taken a human investigator months to uncover, right? Or, or not at all. You know, there's, there's disconnected data sets, regionally different countries, disparate sources of information to be looking at in different systems. But when you kind of aggregate all of these indicators together, you get this picture nice and clearly, and it kind of get raised in an automated fashion to your investigators. You know, we're, we're seeing things like, as I mentioned, high-risk channels, so we've got cross-border transactions. We've got the use of trade finance in there. You know, we've got um, shell companies in there. We've got Phoenix and entities. Um, we've got cyclical transaction flows. So when you start piecing together all of these indicators that in of them themselves, as I mentioned, might be interesting, but are they really enough to generate an alert? It's when you aggregate and consolidate is when we really start to pick up, you know, the high risk activity like this. Um, I'm going to kind of wrap up there because I am very conscious of time and I want to get some questions in. Um, but over to you, Nathan. Cheers. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Tom. Grab a chair. Uh, I do think we have one quick poll question we can jump off there, but whilst that um, questions up, we're dealing with that, which relates to uh, assessing risk and what you've just seen here, the dynamism of the change that's going on. I just want to jump off the back of this, and you've obviously demonstrated, um, Tom, the complexity in what we're seeing today. I mean, that's a tri trade finance kind of example, but Vardana and Stephen, do you see this same type of complexity increasing, changing, emerging, Vardana, I might go to you in, in terms of your experience, particularly as it relates to the, the, the kind of corruption activity in the, in, in the Pacific region as well. Do you see multiple facets of multiple indicators coming together to, to, to support that work? Yeah, I um, certainly have seen a increase in this sophistication in terms of the methods that are used, in terms of the um, sort of the intersectionality between corruption and some other um, predicate offences as well. Um, you know, it, it appears most of what we see is not um, cross-border transactions. Most of the activity that we see at BSP is actually within um, domiciled within the in-country. Um, but certainly we have noted that the schemes that are being used, the um, methodologies that are being used are increasingly becoming more sophisticated. Um, the, whenever we put in any types of um, controls to try and um, eliminate certain activities, uh, the, the customers are very quick to come back with, with um, further advanced um, methods to try and get around those controls. So that's, um, that's something that we've observed, perhaps at a lower level of sophistication to what is being um, discussed here, but um, certainly an increase in, and also an increase in the use of digital yep. technology. Uh, uh, judging by the results on the screen there, you know, most entities rely on traditional transaction monitoring investigations to identify networks as opposed to analytical risk models. So I don't think you're, you're inconsistent there necessarily. Stephen, the same, the same sort of trend. I mean, you're, you're an AFP investigator through and through, true investigations in, in some respects with all source access. Is, is this the similar thing that you see here as well? When you're trying to, to really generate and understand the risks that are emerging, yeah, I mean, I'll just, I'll move off terrorism for a second, but we certainly see it in organised crime. So um, there are syndicates out there that import narcotics into Australia, but then they will use a separate syndicate to actually do their money laundering activities. And that's where I suppose we would see the sophistication similar to what Tom touched on there. Terrorism is probably a little bit less sophisticated, um, but, uh, but, you know, we, like I covered in my, I suppose, my speech or my presentation that we are seeing a much greater use now of the digital side uh, being used. Yep. It, it does go to a question in some respects of the, the typologies that we, we talk about in, in these forums and we share. Are we only capturing one facet of the typology? And, and, and Tom, I think your, your large 
complex example might demonstrate there's more to do. And, and I think there's a question here for, for you, Tom. Um, you mentioned this is a new approach to aggregating risk indicators. What impact do you think this will have on operational team structures who, you, who are used to large scale triage, low quality alert handling? This is, this is about our operating model within our institutions, essentially. That's a good question. Um, I think there's definitely going to be an impact, right? So. I can't see it being immediate, but a kind of gradual shift away from these large scale operational triage teams that have you know, 10 minute, 20 minute SLAs to get a level one alert out the door, right? Any alert that you can close as a false positive within five minutes is likely to be not a good alert. Um, so I think ultimately where we're getting to or where we'd like to get to is to actually automate a lot of the aggregation of risk so that investigators are actually warranted the time to spend with, with kind of the appropriate tool sets at their fingertips to actually go in and investigate these, these high risk activities. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely see a change in the kind of, you know, more process led approach. Um, I don't see it being a quick change, um, but yeah, I think it, it kind of has to go that way if we truly want to start detecting and disrupting these more, you know, complex activities at scale. Thanks, Tom. Stephen, going back to you know, typologies, this is the purpose of the session, so coming back to, to yourself, um, someone's asked the question about, you've seen a change in, in IMVE profile, um, that being more di diverse. What's the impetus for, for, for that change that's occurred? The impetus for why we see more IMVE? What, you know, what are the factors behind that, that change, I suppose? Well, I think COVID probably had something to do with it. We touched on the issue motivated stuff and the anti-government sentiment. I, I suppose one thing I should have said in the presentation, uh, um, but which is, I suppose, an important difference between the religious motivated and the ideologically motivated is, you know, when we, I, I talked about our threat level being probable and it talks about, you know, intent and capability. We, normally with religious motivated, we can sort of identify the intent, but we're sort of searching for the capability. It's sort of flipped a little bit with the ideologically stuff where they have the capability. Um, it's what's their actual true intent. And that's something when we're talking about descriptors in transactions and stuff so that they can sort of lead us or what items they may be purchasing online. I touched on things like memorabilia they may be buying. That starts showing us some sort of ideology um, and I suppose increase for us, that's an important information of where we may put our resources and stuff. Just going back to some of the questions, Vardana, uh, you spoke about resource challenges in in the Pacific, yeah. um, which I think we all we, we all agree on our own levels of the resource challenges with our own institutions, um, and obviously the challenge of training people there. So you, so you talked about steps being already taken. Um, you mentioned you're having a team of 100 now. So what are the things that that, that BSP is doing a little bit differently, given given the nature of the institution and where you are? Um, we've just basically had to create our own programs and systems from scratch. Um, we've, you know, there is a lot of um, information out there, there is a lot of assistance out there, but a lot of it isn't actually um, appropriate to or has to be adapted to the Pacific. Um, I have spoken and um, Orb is here and he'll know we've, we've had discussions about actually extending training and making, modifying training and making it more appropriate um, to the Pacific um, and to the environments within which we exist. Because you have to understand, um, we have been taking on um, staff and developing them in an environment where sometimes you don't have power um, and then your generator runs out of fuel. Um, and you know, you talk about getting KYC. Um, people don't have actual addresses and post boxes, and, and your address might be the third coconut tree past the bridge, you know, across from the lagoon. Uh, but you can't give that address to your correspondent bank. So there's just uh, so many challenges. But I guess what we've done is we've just adapted and we've just um, used what we had, and. Um, you know, um, relied on people and, and relied on um, ACAMS and, and other institutions where we can, but then we've modified things to try and suit our own environment. Fantastic, thank you. Now, unfortunately, we're, we're at time. Um, I understand there's some refreshments and networking out there, so again, I don't want to hold people up, but 
I do want to thank our, our speakers here. Three different presentations today, as I'm sure you agree, but, but hopefully you can see the challenges that we're all facing are all, all quite similar, whether it's the complexity of the investigations, whether it's the, the, the ability to provide or get the right information, as we just heard then, and the ability to interrogate that as well, as Tom's just unpacked as well. So can I just say, can we put our hands together and, and thank our panellists today?